Hi, welcome back to module two on the connectivity for blocking uh, artificial intelligence of things. So in this module, uh, we will be talking first of all about some of the commonly used uh, internet of things uh, protocols and uh, also used for the artificial, intel uh, artificial internet of artificial intelligence of things. So first of all, uh, MQTT is uh, actually a standard protocol that has been in use for uh, quite a while now. And it is actually quite widely uh, adopted by many different cloud providers as well as the IoT uh, device uh, makers. So it is actually an OASIS, a standard messaging protocol for the Internet of Things. It was a design uh, with it being extremely lightweight uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a criteria and it's actually ideal for connecting remote uh, devices with small code footprint and minimal network bandwidth. So MQTT uh, is used in a variety of uh, industries such as automotive, manufacturing, telecommunications and oil and gas. Now there's this mention that it is a lightweight publish and subscribe messaging uh, transport so uh, what is meant by that is that uh, the way that the messages are being transmitted is in the form of a message uh, rather than a connection or a continuous uh, stream of uh, data. So uh, think of the difference between uh, uh, a, a telegram, uh, connect, uh, sorry, a, a wired connection. Let's say you're trying to make a phone call from uh, one person to another and once you make that connection, you can just keep transmitting information or your voice continuously over the wired telephone. So this is actually one mode of communications. And the other mode of communication would be something that probably more of us are familiar now, which is basically a WhatsApp or a SMS based communication. So you are not basically transmitting uh, your voice as a continuous stream of information, but what you will be doing is that you are uh, composing that information into a single message. It could be an SMS or it could be a WhatsApp message, but it's a, a, it's a, it's a message, right? So, uh, in the form of a packet or a diagram. Uh, uh, this is akin to actually sending a letter. Okay, so if you want to go back to that uh, original uh, analogy, in the past, when we are making a voice call uh, or a telephone call to someone, we are just that's one mode, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a continuous uh, communication between one point and another. Uh, but uh, the other way to actually send the information across is to send a postcard or a letter. So that is actually uh, information in the form of a single message or what we call a datagram. So the MQTT's uh, mode of communication is not like a telephone, it's more like the letter or the SMS. It's a single uh, datagram or packet of information being sent across uh, uh, what we call a message. Now it's published and subscribed because just like the letters that we sent, uh, there is a post office in between them, right? That post office sort of takes a, take a look at the, at, at, the, at the letter and then forwards it to anyone who is actually uh, supposed to be reading the letter. So publish is uh, basically this notion that you will write the addressee or the information, uh, where's the information destined for on the message itself. Subscribe is you registering for that particular address. So unlike a normal post office or, or letter where when, uh, the, there's only one single copy of the, of the letter, when you send the letter to a particular address, only that one single copy <laughs> arrives at the destination. But in the case of the MQTT, uh, it is a publish and subscribe mode, which means that there's actually multiple recipients who can subscribe to the same address, right? So it, the, the postman that's in between, right? The post office that's in between actually basically makes copies of the information uh, to multiple subscribers. So you send in one letter into the post office or the, or the message broker in this case, but the message broker will then actually mix copies and then for every single person who has subscribed to that particular uh, topic, that is, is inter or that particular address that's of interest, that, th that message is copied and then actually sent to multiple recipients. So it's a bit different from a normal uh, point to point uh, uh, letter transfer kind of arrangement. Uh, so this is actually 
from one point uh, you publish into this particular address, uh, it is then actually sent out to all the uh, corresponding addresses, uh, sorry, all the corresponding recipients who have subscribed to the same address. All right, so there's actually a, a topic uh, that uh, they would be actually subscribed to rather than what we call an address, but it, has, it is basically the same notion, right? It is actually an intended destination for that particular uh, message. Now, on top of uh, having just one publisher for a topic, uh, uh, we can actually have multiple publishers publishing to the same topic. So it is uh, capable of actually allowing for multi uh, senders to multi recipients for the same topic. So this is actually quite useful. Uh, think about it, uh, if I have uh, multiple applications that may be actually analyzing the same data uh, in different manners, uh, what I want to be sure of is that when my sensor sends in one single information for this topic, uh, the, all the applications who are interested in this particular uh, event or, or, or message coming in uh, for, based on a particular topic, uh, will actually receive their own copy of the relevant message. And if the, temp if the topic is temperature and there are multiple temperature sensors in the whole of my factory floor, uh, all of the senders could be sending to the same topic. So we don't need to keep creating new uh, mailboxes for diff uh, the multiple sensors. We just need to create one single mailbox uh, for that particular topic of temperature, and then all the temperature sensors can send into this mailbox. And all subscribers who are interested in temperature readings will get the corresponding output as well. So let's move on to, to the next slide. So why MQTT? So MQTT, uh, you can actually look for more details at the mqtt.org uh, website. So MQTT clients are basically quite lightweight. Uh, they require minimal resources. So it's quite suitable for use on a, a less capable IoT device. So it doesn't have to be a higher end uh, AI OT device. You can use it even for smaller clients. So of course, having more resources, uh, you can definitely support this on an AI OT device as well. It allows uh, communications in both directions. So you can send from the device to the cloud and also from the cloud uh, back to the device. So this actually allows it to be a platform for broadcasting a message to all sensors. Uh, it is very scalable, it can be scaled to millions of devices. There is support for some amount of reliable transmission and the level of reliability can be configured. So you can have a lowest level, which is just once or nothing. Uh, at least once that means you will just make sure that it is at least one copy will be sent. So the message will always get through, although there may be multiple copies. And two, yeah, meaning that this is, will be the most uh, highest level of uh, reliability, which that you will be guaranteed to at least once and only once, no duplicates will be sent. And uh, the message will also not be missing. There is support uh, for MQTT uh, over different transport protocols to ensure that uh, even though the underlying uh, radio network may be unreliable, yet it's possible to actually send that message uh, reliably across uh, to the post office or the MQTT broker. So uh, as I mentioned just now, this is, uh, MQTT is based on the messaging uh, idea. So there is a sort of an equivalent of a post office uh, that receives the message and then reroutes that message to the other recipients. So the post office for MQTT is also called the MQTT broker. And lastly, there is some provisions for uh, security so that uh, your messages will be uh, reliable and also having some secure uh, communication ensured. So it will not be easily uh, copied out. So it's just using the transport layer security, similar to what we see on the other internet protocols. Here we see uh, a diagram showing us the configuration. So we have the client, okay that actually senses the information and then it publishes that topic, the address, right? Is uh, all this information, this information is being related to uh, this thing called topic. So 
there may be multiple publishers actually publishing through this similar topic temperature. Here we have the postman, the MQTT broker, and all the clients who have uh, sort of subscribed to this topic, they will receive the same information for the topic. So once the temperature sensor sends information up for this topic temperature, everyone who has indicated they are interested in this topic of temperature, uh, so you can have multiple applications, they will both receive a copy of the same message. So the MQTT broker is actually taking charge of making uh, this replication uh, or copying of the data into two copies uh, within the post office itself. So the MQTT does the routing as also does the replication for multiple subscribers. So here you have the information basically flowing from one end to the other, but you can see here that uh, if uh, I have a, something that actually subscribes to a particular topic, it will also receive the corresponding information related to that topic. There is a, a well-known uh, Python a library called the Peho library or Paho library, uh, basically it's an Eclipse uh, project. So you can actually go to this website, eclipse.org slash uh, and it su uh, actually supports uh, the two uh, common variants of uh, MQTT QTT protocol, which is the MQTT as well as the MQTT-SN. Now the MQTT protocol, actually there is a new version five out, uh, but uh, the more widely adopted one is still the older uh, version of the MQTT protocol, which is the 3.x uh, version. So the MQTT SN is actually incorporated into the new version. So it's not existing as a separate standard, uh, but most implementations actually still have these two uh, separate. Right, let's move on to another protocol, which is the AMQP protocol, which is the Advanced Messaging uh, Queuing Protocol. This is actually uh, for business messaging. So just like the MQTT messaging uh, protocol, uh, there's this notion that the information is sent as a message or as a datagram. So it's not a continuous uh, transmission of uh, information like a telephone call. Right? It's actually more like an SMS or WhatsApp where you're actually sending it message by message. And uh, so it's like a letter. So just like the MQTT, there's also a message broker, the AMQP broker, which is like a post office. So it will collect the information that's being uh, sent into it and it will actually then make copies uh, and replicate the information to all uh, subscribers who are actually interested in that particular message. So why uh, use uh, AMQP? Uh, again, AMQP, just like SMQTT, is actually quite uh, widely adopted by many organizations. Uh, it started off not so much for uh, IoT devices. So it does have a slightly higher uh, resource requirement as compared with MQTT. But uh, it is quite widely adopted, especially uh, with its origins in the finance uh, sector. So it is uh, being adopted largely because it is a standard way of doing things so you, to avoid uh, vendor lock-in. So here you can see the so-called infrastructure uh, capable uh, at AMQP, uh, meshes brokers where information is coming in is then replicated and copied out to all subscribers for that same information. So you can have services that are like cloud services that are actually subscribers, so they will receive information. You have suppliers uh, that may, or like clients that will actually provide or send in the information to the broker. So uh, you can see that AMQP is actually, uh, has one uh, big concern that's a bit different from the MQTT and that's actually that it's really intended to have cross organization communication. The information being received into this infrastructure may be actually transmitted to another organization, not the original organization. 
So this is actually a bit different from the MQTT, which is not uh, mainly designed uh, with this in mind. Of course, it is still possible technically to send that information with uh, MQTT across organizations, but AMQP has this design specifically uh, in the standard itself. There is actually the uh, Python library that you can use to actually uh, send or receive information uh, for the AM, uh, AMQP. And this is actually the Picker library. So the asynchronous version is uh, this one, uh, AIO uh, Picker, which basically runs over the Picker library, which implements the uh, AMQP protocol itself. So you can go to this website. Uh, there's actually, uh, you can just do a pip install for on your own client. Uh, but if you want interested in more information, you can just look this up. Uh, there's actually a wrapper, et cetera, and documentation at the website, aiopicker.readthedocs.io. Uh, there are other libraries as well, but this is actually one of the ones that's actually actively being uh, maintained. Then we talk about a more resource constrained protocol. So the other two protocols, they do require your client device uh, or the sensor device that's sending information to have more resources. So it will not be possible to implement uh, those protocols uh, as easily if your IoT device is basically based on just a very simple 8-bit microcontroller. So this other protocol, the CoAP protocol, is actually designed for such an environment. If your Internet of Things uh, device is very resource constrained, it may be just a simple 8-bit microcontroller, doesn't have a memory controller, doesn't have, has very limited uh, RAM on board, um, then you cannot fit in something like a full Linux uh, operating system on it. Uh, this particular protocol, CoAP, would be able to uh, handle those constraints uh, more easily. So you can see that this is a constraint application protocol, constraint in terms of constraint, uh, in terms of having very limited resources. So it's actually a specialized web transfer protocol for use with constraint nodes and constraint networks in the Internet of Things. The protocol is designed for machine to machine, with the Internet of Things, applications such as smart energy and building automation. So this is actually coming from the IETF. So all IETF uh, standards, actually, you can refer to the standard from the tools of IETF.org, and it's actually RFC, request, request for comments uh, 7252 that actually documents this particular standard. So here again, the same abstract shows you that it's actually meant for constraint nodes. That means often having just 8-bit microcontrollers with small amounts of RAM and ROM, and also operating over very constrained uh, networks. That means it's very low power networks, such as the six low pan or uh, Bluetooth low energy, and does not have very high uh, throughput in terms of transmission speed. So this is a constrained application protocol. So if you look at the stack, uh, you will find that the applications uh, send in their requests to this uh, API that implements the CoAP uh, response, request and response. It gets translated into a message, which is then actually uh, sent over both the UDP. And uh, in this case, because it's resource constrained, we cannot use the standard uh, TLS or the Transport layer security or SSL based uh, security, which like what we have on the uh, web stack. Instead, we have a more simplified uh, transport uh, security layer called the DTLS. Now, this can be sent over a normal IP uh, version of uh, IP uh, protocol over Ethernet, or it could be actually uh, going through a, a version of uh, IP with a six uh, called the six low pan, where you could actually convert it. Uh, is this six low pan actually sits over the IPv4, so it's sort of convert it into a form that actually is able to transmit over Zigbee type uh, radio devices, the 802.15.4 uh, radio protocol, and then actually sent sent out to the uh, destination. So six low pan is actually the 
so-called the uh, kind of IP protocol that is built for transmission over less reliable uh, wireless network, such as this one, Zigbee, which has very much smaller packets than what you typically find in the 802.11 or Wi-Fi um, or radio or communication uh, wireless network. So it does need to have some sort of uh, like a modification of a uh, layer so that the, the transmission could still uh, occur with your normal IP protocol, but the underlying radio network is actually using a slightly different structure from your normal Wi-Fi network. So it is actually possible to uh, have uh, bro the broker or uh, the postman uh, do a translation uh, between the two. So for example, here, if you have a gateway device that has both a MQTT as well as the co-app, we can actually have the app, uh, application set up information in MQTT uh, format. The sensors, in this case, I think the water sensor sending information to an MQTT broker and the broker, uh, if it also has the co-app support within the same uh, gateway device, you can then send back some information down to maybe the light switch. Okay, so if it's uh, cold, you need to turn on the heater, maybe the information comes in from the temperature and then it is translated internally to a co-app application and it goes down via another protocol to another uh, output device. Okay, so in this case, we have a gateway that also functions as a translation device. Similarly, at the client end, if we want to actually receive uh, data from both uh, MQTT as well as co-app protocols, uh, we do actually need a client that can support both these stacks. Okay, so it's a dual stack protocol, one for MQTT and one for co-app. Now, if you have a dual stack uh, clients, right, uh, that means your device itself or your client itself receives uh, both types of uh, protocols, then uh, you do not, do not need this uh, to be done at the gateway level. And of course, uh, for some uh, application protocols, you can actually send that, that data out directly uh, via some protocol or through the cloud all the way to the end device. Because UDP, after all, can be, and IP itself also can be trans uh, transmitted across the entire network. It does, it's not limited to only one single network. It can actually be transmitted across the cloud to the end uh, application. But the other way to do it is to, is to do this uh, via the gateway. So the gateway converts the more resource-constrained protocols like this into just a standard HTTP or your uh, internet protocols, uh, web type protocols to send to it to the end device. So uh, we have the asynchronous protocol version of CoAP, just like the AI picker, uh, AIO picker. We also have the AIO CoAP, which is a Python CoAP uh, library. You can read the documentation from this uh, source. So it's not supported in the standard uh, library packages. So you need to actually download this third party package to uh, support this. Uh, is compliant uh, with some of these applications. Okay, so this is actually written in Python 3, so you can actually use it uh, with the more modern version of Python. Another protocol is actually uh, one that is actually built for telemetry. So again, for not for to cross the whole internet, but really to collect the information in the local uh, network. And this is really, just like the co-app, is also built for very resource-constrained uh, uh, devices. So here is, uh, is comparison versus other protocols. So you can see that for, uh, for co-app and DDS, they only require UDP. They do not require the full TCP stack. So hence, uh, it can actually be suitable for use in a more resource constrained uh, environment. So you don't need the full TCP stack. So don't need so much memory, uh, RAM and ROM to actually implement this. Now it, it's also made in a way to be also supporting TCP if you have that available, but it doesn't require it. You can also run it over UDP if it's resource constrained. And it's just as before, you can see that the DTLS, the more resource constrained transport layer security is available for co-app and DDS. 
Uh, but DDS also allows for you to use the TLS if your device is like this, if it can is capable of TCP IP is probably having enough resources to also implement the TLS as well. So there are options in terms of the transport as well as the security uh, mechanism you use. And MQTT and both uh, AMQTP and MQTT do require more capable devices. As you can see from the protocol that they use, uh, they are assuming that your device is definitely not simple, simpler devices, but more capable ones. Right, then we have a different protocol called the XMPP. So originally, actually, XMPP was not built for the Internet of Things. Uh, it was built for messages, uh, just like AMQP and uh, MQTT, uh, as well as the DDS, which is a message-based protocol. But it was built for messages uh, for more chat-like applications. Okay, so XMPP is originally built for more chat-type applications for people to communicate rather than for things, but it has been adopted uh, for use within an IoT environment as well. So there's a very solid uh, backing in terms of interoperability, uh, interoperability from experience uh, of using this protocol for chat-like services. So you can see what are the users of AXMPP, inter instant messaging, right? Like your WhatsApp or your Telegram or your uh, Facebook Messenger or your Skype. Instant messaging, uh, it can be transported using this protocol. And, and as I said, it has also been ad adopted uh, for the use in the case of Internet of Things as well. And then there are other online gaming applications, uh, social applications that do actually make use of XMPP as well. So it, this is actually one of the IoT protocols that have uh, other applications. So another one that you'll be looking at is actually how we can reuse the web stack, right? What we typically use in the web browser for use in the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, this is actually writing on the same idea that uh, once we have the gathered sufficient experience with a uh, use in a particular protocol, can we then just write on that experience to uh, uh, modify or adopt that you uh, that particular protocol uh, in the use in the Internet of Things as well? because that would actually save us a lot of experimentation with a new protocol where there may be some characteristic we are not very sure of. Even in terms of reference implementations being available, this small established protocols like XMPP and, and web, there are many references, uh, reference implementations out there so people know how to build this kind of things, right? Where something that's totally uh, defined uh, from scratch, uh, there's less implementation experience. So just like the other co-app protocol, uh, since it's from the IETF, you can actually find the standard uh, RSC 6120 on the tools.ietf.org's uh, uh, website. And uh, incidentally, IETF stands for Internet Engineering Task Force, which is, is actually, this is a body that actually got, uh, controls the different uh, RFCs of effectively what we call standards that run the internet. There is the Python version of the XMPP protocol implementation. So this the one popular. There, there are multiple ones, but this one popular one is actually the NBX MPP, still actively uh, maintained. Uh, has asynchronous capability. So it can actually operate more efficiently. Asynchronous is actually useful if you want the uh, need to operate uh, faster, okay, it's able to handle more requests per second than a blocking interface. And with that, we actually come uh, to the end of part three, which is on the different uh, internet protocols. So as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, the reason for this uh, multitude of internet protocols really is the fact that uh, they're actually underlying transmission technologies vary a lot according to the speed, the range, the power requirements, as well as whether they can support the kind of device density that we require for that application. So the protocols were designed also to handle the different radio or wireless uh, network environments. So some protocols 
have been designed very specifically to work within a very resource constrained environment such as the COAD and uh, DDS protocol. So the underlying radio or uh, wireless net sensor network that you have may not be able to support very large uh, messages or datagrams or packets. So you need to have some sort of uh, adaptation layer to actually uh, break up your messages into smaller packets so that you can send it over the radio. Whereas for other uh, messaging protocols, they are more focused on interoperability and they do require the protocol stack to be more capable. Uh, they may actually need some modification uh, or they are not able to actually, or they will not be able to work on this more uh, resource constrained type of wireless and, uh, network environments. So we, that tense is actually uh, not the, likely to be the case that we have only one a particular protocol to handle all possible environments. Uh, but currently, uh, part of the problem also is historical in the sense that different standard organizations actually came up with almost equivalent protocols that can do uh, many similar things. So one of, the, on, on one of the other approaches that people have also taken is that instead of trying to define something like MQT, QT, MQTT or AMQP, which has already been defined, uh, but maybe the implementation is uh, not as uh, widespread uh, in different application areas. So the other approach is really to take advantage of something that's already been implemented for the internet of people. Uh, and just adopt or adapt it for use uh, for the Internet of Things. So XMPP being one of them. And the next set of slides that we will talk about uh, later on where we talk about the use of the Web of Things, uh, that is actually using the web stack, right? The stack of protocols that's used for the World Wide Web uh, and adapt it for use in the Internet of Things. The reason for these two uh, approaches, XMPP and Web of Things, really that there's a lot of implementation experience using those protocols. So if you can write on that, uh, you basically your interoperability in terms of the practical experience of people using those protocols will be much higher than the more exotic protocols like MQTT and uh, AMQP. Uh, they, uh, uh, not to say that they are, but they are very new, uh, they have been around for a while. So actually there are many uh, deployments of MQTT and AMQP uh, today. But uh, in, ter in terms of scale, right, uh, nothing beats the World Wide Web in terms of scale to uh, billions of uh, devices uh, around the, the world. So whereas we are growing the Internet of Things into a larger scale, moving from the earlier years to a uh, more widespread use with AIoT, with 5G, um, perhaps uh, looking uh, more deeply into trying to adopt some of the experience that we gained with the World Wide Web for all the Internet of Things uh, makes a whole lot of sense. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for your attention.